All right, let's uh, get started. Um, okay. All right. Okay. Um, so we're going to start a new new topic in the next few weeks, uh, and uh, let me start that by some of you know some of the basics of this, but. Uh, let me start by uh, trying to find out the solution to this problem, right? So I have a directed graph here, and I want to remove as few edges as possible so that there is no path from S to T, okay? So what do you think that the answer is in this graph? How many edges? do I need to remove so that there is no path from S to T? Three, uh, three will suffice because if I remove all the edges going out of S, then there is no way for, uh, for S to reach T, right? Okay. Sorry? Oh, there is four. Yeah, yeah, okay. How many edges are going out of S? Four edges leave. So, 4 will definitely suffice, okay, but is it the smallest? 3, somebody has found a solution with 3, what are those 3 edges? Sorry? How about uh, the number of edges going into T, right? That is uh, 3, right? If I remove those edges, I can't go from S to T. So, okay, but can I remove 2 and uh, still do it? How about... Uh, can I cut two edges and separate S from T? How do I know? I don't know actually the answer to this, so I'm searching, right? I, yeah, right? It's not obvious, no? Even in this small graph, yeah, there are lots of possible combinations, right? So, okay, that's uh, a non trivial problem. Right, and I say somebody comes and says, you know, can you solve this efficiently? How would we go about solving it, right? So this is a kind of a problem that is not easy to solve using techniques such as recursion and dynamic programming and so on, okay, that we've seen before. Right? There's no obvious solution that we can, there's no obvious way to see that there would be an efficient algorithm for this simple to state problem, right? Uh, but turns out there is, we'll see a, a, a way to do that. Uh, so let me ask a related problem, which is, is there a path from S to T, right? Well, you know, that's not very hard, right? Well, on the graph, it is not very hard to see there's a path from S to T, and algorithmically also, it's not hard to check whether there is a path from S to T, right? That's one of the most basic algorithmic problems in graphs that we study, is uh, T reachable from S, right? But now let's ask a more difficult question. I don't want just one path, I want two paths from S to T. Okay, what does it mean two paths? Well, you know, uh, why do I want two paths, right? Why do I want two paths? Okay, you know, I want to make sure that there are two different ways of reaching going from S to T. So in particular, think of, a, you know, a routing application or something, and I want to find two paths that don't share any edges. Okay, why, if I had two paths that don't share any edges, what do I know? I know that even if one edge breaks, I can still go from S to T, right? So why two? Maybe I want three paths from S to T. So here is another problem. You know, I look at, give you this graph and say, how many edge disjoint paths are there from S to T, okay? That is, you know, can I go from S to T via, I mean, can I find uh, uh, three edge disjoint paths from S to T or two edge disjoint paths from S to T, right? So let's look, that, look at that, right? You know, uh, uh, here, is, uh, here is one path, right? Yeah? Uh, can I find another path? Uh, sure, uh, you know, I can find this path, right? Uh, can I find another path which is disjoint from those three? Okay, I can find this path, right? All right? Okay, what about, can I find one more? Sorry? S could be through T from 
S to B to D, but that is not edge disjoint from this, right? I want paths which don't share any edges, okay? Ah, right, okay. So, good, that's a good observation, right? There cannot be more than three paths because there are only three edges going to T, okay? So, clearly, if there is a cut of value 3, that means if I can remove three edges and disconnect S from T, there cannot be more than three paths from S to T, right? Yeah? But all of them have to go through those three edges and they have to be edge disjoint, so there can only be three paths, okay? So, in this example, it turned out that you know, there you can, because I gave you three paths, can there be two edges which can disconnect S from T? Can I remove two edges and remove, a, I cannot, right, because I have three disjoint paths, so I, I cannot do that, right? So this proves to you that there are three edge disjoint paths and no more than three edge disjoint paths, right? Why do, why do I know there are no more than three edge disjoint paths? Because I gave you a cut of value 3, so I can't have more than 3 disjoint paths. Also because I gave you 3 disjoint paths, you know that the cut is at least 3, right? So the actually, so the cut, the minimum cut must be 3 exactly, right? Yeah? Okay. So this kind of argument where this what's called a min-max theorem is uh, related to duality and that's a different way of coming up with polynomial time algorithms for problems, okay? It's a very fundamental phenomenon and it's very different from, from uh, standard computer science style techniques like recursion and dynamic programming, right? So this is a, a different way of developing efficient algorithms for problems, okay? Yeah? So this problem would you expect to find the number of disjoint paths from S to T? No, I didn't. I just, I, I have two different problems, right? One is the minimum cut problem. The other is to find the number of disjoint paths. Okay. No, no. I mean that we have to prove, right? We don't know. All we know at this point is that the maximum number of disjoint paths we can get is no more than the minimum cut. Right? It gives an upper bound. Okay, right? We know that the minimum cut is at least as large as the number of disjoint paths I can get. Right? That makes sense. Okay. So are they equal? If they're equal, then I have a very nice uh, duality, right? That somehow the always I can get as many paths as the minimum cut. And it's not at all obvious that it's true, okay? And it turns out that it's true, that's called Menger's theorem, okay? Now, the, no, that's, uh, that's okay, that's a, a graph theoretical result, right? You know, uh, Menger proved it long ago in the 30s. The maximum number of disjoint paths is equal to the minimum cut. But now we can ask, you know, the algorithmic question. Why is it that you can compute either of these things? Okay? The question is, you know, can you compute the minimum cut? Or if I want the maximum number of disjoint paths, how will I compute it? Right? So it turns out that computing these quantities is actually related to the fact that they're equal. Right? There is a nice uh, duality which allows us to compute them. And computing them is also gives us a nice understanding of why they're equal. Okay? So that is... Basically, the cornerstone of combinatorial optimization is this duality relationships, right? And so we'll see uh, that uh, in 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 uh, in this in this flows, and and uh, so uh, keep those in mind. Uh, and and uh, network flow is this uh, a, a broad class of problems, okay? Uh, and and uh, flow problems are uh, basically motivated by by all kinds of communication. Uh, networks, right? So, I mean, a lot of our uh, applications or, or a lot of the things that we do involve communication, right? You know, uh, these days communication, we think of, uh, you know, maybe phones and uh, internet and stuff, but in the olden days, people used to drive, right? <laughs> and that's the main communication network, right? Uh, transportation is a big, big, uh, big uh, uh, network that, that, that we, we are familiar with in our lives. Uh, you know, internet backbone networks, um, and and many on many right. You know, uh, so what is what is uh, some of, what are some of the features of these networks, right? The, some of the features of these networks are that somehow there is a notion of the links of this network or the nodes of this network having some capacity, right? Uh, for example, you know, if you take uh, the, the roads, right, you know, the, the width of the road is some uh, proxy for the capacity of that, right? 
or if you take communication networks, the, the, the capacity is there, right? You know, it, it can support uh, 5 gigabits per second, or if it's an Ethernet cable, it's 10 megabits per second, right? So it, there is a notion of a thickness of a pipe, or a, right? So we want to associate a number with each of these edges or nodes sometimes, which represents some capacity of how much um, can that object, like uh, the, the edge, support in terms of something that has to go on that, right? In the case of road networks, it's uh, traffic. In the case of internet networks or, or, or backbones, it is, is the packets or uh, whatever, right? Uh, bits, right? And there's also the notion that information or traffic is originating somewhere and ending up somewhere, right? There's so many packets starting at uh, our campus and ending up in uh, maybe New York, right? And, uh, but so many things starting at our campus and ending up in, uh, in China or, you know, India, right? You know, so there's a notion that there's a lot of, uh, tra I mean, there's some amount of information or traffic going from some point in the network to some other point in the network, right? And there's also the notion that all these uh, communication things are sharing the network together, right? So, so there is a notion of capacity on the net edges, there's a notion of the traffic originating somewhere and ending up somewhere, and the notion that they're all sharing the network together, right? All the traffic from, uh, from uh, Champaign to Chicago and also maybe from, uh, you know, uh, uh, Memphis to Chicago maybe is going on I-57, right? So I-57 is shared by many, many things. Okay. And, and then, uh, 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 so, so in general, this, uh, so because of the importance of these things, there are many models, many applications, many variations of the basic flow problem. So here, we'll start with the, uh, the most basic setting, which already has uh, powerful applications as well as implications, right? So what is the most basic setting? There's only one pair that wants to communicate. Right? Which is not the case in most networks we deal with, right? But we'll simplify our life. The network is only there for supporting communication between one pair that wants to communicate. So we'll call that the single source, single sink, right? There's an S and T, and S wants to send information from it to T. Okay? Those are clearly the simplest setting we can think of, right? So it has a whole network to itself, right? Okay? And, and every other node is just there to help this, this, this pair. And then what is the features we have? We have capacities on the edges, right? We'll think later about capacities on the, on the edges. And we'll call this S the source, and we'll call T the sink. You have to be a little careful uh, of the terminology source and sink, okay? Because typically when you think about a cyclic graph, the source is a vertex which has only edges coming out. A sink is a vertex which has edges coming, right? But you have to be a little careful because it's abused here. Source doesn't mean that it only has edges going out. It may have edges coming in, but we'll still call it the source because it is originating information. The meaning of source here is a little different. You have to be a little careful. Okay? Okay? So it's right. Okay. Uh, we'll first also assume that all capacities are integer because that will simplify our life. You know, we'll deal with other cases later. And so, uh, so now we have to think, you know, how do we formally define what's the notion of information going from S to T, what is this thing called flow, right? So we'll define flow as the following, right? There are two ways of thinking about flow. Both are equally important. They have different applications. Typically flow in even in introductory books is defined only in one way, but I like to define both ways simultaneously and then show some equivalences and then do other things, okay? Because well, I think it's important to think of it in two ways. Okay, first let's do the edge-based definition of flow. And, and then we'll come to the path-based definition of flow. So what is the edge-based definition of flow, right? So flow is, a, a mathematically, uh, formally speaking, is the following thing, right? There are different ways of thinking about it. So it's a function that assigns to each edge some number, right? Think of it as how much traffic is flowing on that edge, okay? And it has to satisfy two natural constraints that we would want something traveling in a network to satisfy, right? One is that the flow on an edge is no more than the capacity of the edge. Okay? This is how much information is flowing on that edge, so it can't be more than the capacity of that edge. Okay? Okay, for every edge, that is true. 
And the second thing is uh, conservation constraint, right? Because remember here we are thinking about flow going from the source S to the sink T, right? So it is only starting at the source and ending up at the sink, right? If I look at any vertex which is not the source and or the sink, amount of flow coming in has to be amount of flow leaving that, that node, right? Because if, right, that makes sense, right? The, the, the is starting only at the source and sinking, uh, ending up at the sink, right? So we have for every node that is not the source of the sink, the total incoming flow has to be equal to the total outgoing flow, right? Incoming is all the arcs inside coming to the, right? Okay? Yeah? So that's it. That's the flow. Okay? So now we can check on, on, uh, on uh, this graph that, you know, those red numbers satisfy all the constraints, right? Okay? Um, let's see. Uh, there are, you can easily check that the red numbers are less than the black numbers, which are the capacities, right? Now, if you, I mean, it's tedious, but you can look at any node and check that the incoming flow is equal to the outgoing flow. So that's what a flow is, right? Okay. And, and what is the value of the flow, right? You know, so now you're saying, you know, what do we want the notion of the value of the flow to depict? It is how much flow is going from the source to the sink. Okay. So how do we define it formally? We define it formally as you look at the source, you look at all the flow leaving minus the flow entering. You might say, why should flow come back to the source? It's useful to keep that in mind. But if the source has no outgoing edges, we can, uh, sorry, incoming edges, then it's simply the flow leaving the source. Okay. Okay. Now, you can say, why are you defining it that way? Why can't you define it with respect to the sink? Right. It makes equal sense to say, uh, let me define the flow as how much is coming into the sink. Right. Okay. The claim is that if the flow satisfies flow conservation at all the internal nodes, these two quantities are equal, which intuitively should make sense, right? If everywhere the flow is being conserved, that means it's coming in is equal to going out, except the source and the sink, then the amount leaving the source should be equal to the amount coming into the sink. That's not a proof, but one can verify and it makes sense, right? That, that it should make sense, otherwise the definition is somehow flawed, right? Yeah? So that's it. So what is it? Yeah. So what exactly is the reasoning behind the conservation constraints? Like why why do we, why do we assume that uh, we're not going to have packet loss or something? No. So the, the, you can have packet loss, but that's a different, more complicated model, okay. right? You see, this is the most basic model. There is huge number. Of, the flow literature is humongous, right? Uh, you, you, because uh, you. On average, you know, it's gonna yeah, there is no loss, right? There is no loss in this network, right? Uh, second, we are also assuming that there's no notion of time, right? The first thing when you think about uh, networks is like, you know, traffic takes time to go from point A to point B, right? Here we are like, you know, completely ignoring time, right? It's just a number on each edge. What does it mean, right? So you should think of this as some steady state traffic or uh, the mean, right? You know, it's, so it's an idealization. This is not very close to applications in terms of modeling real world, right? If you want to model real world, there are many other things you need to do, right? Flows over time, so lossy flows, okay? A huge amount of, uh, I mean, so practical uh, modeling involves many complications, right? We are throwing all that away and saying that this is a very simple model, okay? Uh, already the simplicity will buy us a lot of stuff, right? So that's, it's good to understand this most basic setting, okay? That makes sense? Okay. Okay, so uh, uh, value of the flow is the total flow out of source minus total flow into source. Uh, this is, uh, you know, conservation of flow, you know, in electrical circuits, you know, you, you, you know this as Kirchhoff's law. And um, once you have the, the, the value of flow, you can also talk about, given a set of vertices, we can ask, you know, how much flow is leaving that set of vertices, okay? You know, it's amount going out of the set minus amount coming in into that set. Now, intuitively, you should see that, you know, if the set doesn't contain the source of the sink, it should be zero, right? If going in should be coming in because uh, there is no source of sink in that. If you have a source, then it should be equal to the value of the this flow. But, you know, you, you, you can verify those. Uh, we will not do that right now, but that's just a definition. Okay, just to make sure that we understand that... You know, it, it is very common for um, uh, 
so here is a flow, okay. What is the value of the flow? I mean, well, we have to first verify that it is actually a flow, but believe me, okay. Uh, what is the value of the flow here? Just to make sure we understand the definition. 13, uh, 13, right? Okay, because 24 is leaving and 14, 15 is coming back. Okay, just to uh, emphasize that, you know, there can be flow coming back into the source and in general, it is useful to remember the formal definition. Okay, okay, good. Uh, now, I am going to define flow very differently. Okay, in a, in a, in a somewhat uh, more intuitive definition for some applications. Okay. So, I am going to say, okay, what is flow, right? You know, flow we define locally as, uh, oh, if I look at each edge, how much flow is going on that, right? How much traffic is going there? Oh, then, oh, if, you know, at any internal node, it should, coming in should be go, equal to going out. But if you step back and say, okay, what do I really want out of flow? I want flow, I, one way of thinking about it is the end-to-end -end notion, right? I want to know, uh, say, you know, if you are basically sending, uh, you know, if you're going from Champaign to Chicago or some other place, you care not only, and you may want to know which path I should take, not just, you know, I'm somehow getting there, right? You may want to know from the start to the end, which route am I going to take, right? And all the way, I need to know the full path, right? If you're sending traffic or if you're thinking about uh, driving or something. So another intuitive way of defining flow is in, in this somewhat uh, uh, complicated fashion at, in, in at a high level, but it will have some advantages, is I say, okay, look, let's look at all the paths from S to T in the graph. The problem with this is there are too many, right? There could be exponentially many paths from S to T in the graph, but let's, it's a definition, why not, right? And then I say, okay, for every path from S to T, tell me how much traffic you're sending on that path. So in this definition, the flow is a function which assigns for every path from S to T a number, okay? So it's a big uh, function, right? It is assigning numbers to paths, okay? And that's it. And what, do we, what else do we need? We still want to make sure that the total flow on any edge cannot be more than the capacity of that edge, right? Okay? So how do we capture that? We say that if you look at any edge, look at all the paths using that edge, the amount of flow that you're routing together on all those paths should be less than the capacity. Yeah, that makes sense? Okay, yeah, and that's it. You may say, okay, what about flow conservation? We don't need flow conservation. Why don't we need flow conservation? What does it mean? There is, there is no need to explicitly impose flow conservation because we are looking at it from an end-to-end -end point of view, right? Every path is starting at the source and ending at the sink. So at every point, the flow is going through that path. So there is no need to explicitly tell you that this flow should be conserved. It is automatically implied. Okay? So we don't need to say anything else. That's it. The flow in this definition is simply an assignment of numbers, non-negative numbers. For every path from S to T, you give a specific number with the condition that on any edge, if you look at all the paths going through that edge, the total flow on that edge should be less than the capacity of that edge. Okay? And that's it. These are two definitions. So you say, okay, you know, which one is the right one, right? Are they related? Are they different? Can we understand them together? And it turns out that, okay, so what is the value of the flow in this definition? It is natural to say, okay, you know, I, I look at all the paths, sum up all the flows, right? That's the, I, that's the total flow I'm sending, right? Yeah? Okay, that's the definition of value of the flow. Uh, here is an example, right? Uh, you know, we are taking a small graph now because uh, there could be, the number of paths could be exponential, right? How many paths are there from S to T in this graph? There are only three paths, right? One path going up, the one path going uh, uh, through the middle, uh, the one path below, right? There are three paths. Now, what is the flow? I say, okay, you know, I, I, for every path, I sell you a number. Right? So this is, on P1 it is 10, P2 it is 4, P3 it is 6. That's a, a flow. Now we have to verify that in fact it satisfies the capacity constraints, right? So, okay, how do we verify? Look at the, the edge SU, right? How many paths are, you on, are using the edge SU? Two, right? You know, P1 and P2. And then if you look at the total sum, it's 10 plus 4 is less than 20, right? Yeah? All right? 
and, and you can verify that for all edges that condition is satisfied, so it is a valid flow. Okay? Yeah? Okay. All right. Uh, now, you know, is, a, is there a connection between a path based flow and an edge based flow? Okay. Okay. One direction is very easy, right? So, if I give you a path based flow, then I claim that there is a natural edge based flow that is implied by that path based flow. What is that? How do you verify that? What, what, I mean, what does that mean, right? So, okay. So that means that, you know, I, I look at this example, I define flow on paths, right? Now I want to find a definition of flow on edges such that it is corresponds to this path-based flow. So what's the natural thing? You look at this path-based flow and look at on each edge how much total flow is flowing on that, okay? Okay, how much is uh, uh, flowing on SU, right? You combine the path the flow on a P1 and P2. How much is that? 14. So I let me write down 14 on that. What about on uh, SV? Sorry? Just 6, right? Only one path is there. What about on uh, UT? UT only one, eh? one path, 10. What about on VT? Where two paths are using, right? 4 and, right? So total thing is 10. What about on U, UV? There's only one path, so and that is 4, right? Okay. So it is natural to convert that, uh, look at all the paths, look at all the edges, you know, how, even to even verify that it is a, f a valid flow, we need to compute these numbers and check that they are satisfying the capacity constraints. Okay. Now look at these numbers, 14, 4, 6, 10, 10. I claim they are a valid edge-based flow. Well, first they satisfy the capacity constraints because the path-based flow has to satisfy this constraint. Now, do they satisfy flow conservation? Why would they satisfy flow conservation? Look at any node, right? Every path adds, comes into the node and goes out of the node, right? Whenever it comes into the node, we, we add the value of that flow to the edge coming on that and we add the same value to the edge going out of that, right? So all the sum of the flow coming in should be equal to the sum of the flow going out. So they automatically satisfy the flow conservation. Okay? Okay. So what we're saying, you know, if you had a definition of a flow on paths, then it automatically implies a definition of a flow on the edges. Okay? Okay, the other way is a little bit more interesting, right? So uh, you see this? This idea makes sense? Okay. Okay. Now let's go back to the other way, and this is called flow decomposition. I um, mean, this is exactly what what I did in an example. This is a very important concept, flow decomposition, right? Uh, so what does it mean? Okay, let me put a picture. Okay, here is a big graph, right? And that's a flow, right? You know, on defined on the edges, right? Okay. So what does it mean? It satisfies the, on each edge, the flow on the edge is less than the capacity, and the, on each node, the internal node, the incoming flow is equal to the outgoing flow, right? Now, I want to think of it as flow on paths, okay? How do I do that, okay? So what does it mean? Can I give you a decomposition of this flow into flow on paths such that the value of the flow is the same, okay? I want to imagine, ah, this, this, this flow is going from S to T along paths and not on locally on the edges, okay? So here is a, an algorithm to do it, and then we'll see why that has some nice properties. Okay, so here is a very simple greedy algorithm, right? You say, okay, look, now let me find a path from S to T, which has all of the edges should have non-zero flow on it, okay? Give me one path from S to T which has non-zero flow on it. Give me any path. But all edges should have non-zero flow on it. No? Nobody wants to give an... Uh... There may be, you know, the greedily you pick the top path, right? You know, okay. Okay. So... Oh. What would happen here?
Okay, so here is one path, right? I'll be greedy and I say, okay, on this path, how much flow can I send on this path? Because, uh, I mean, uh, what is the maximum I can send on this path and remove that flow? Okay, uh, the, the first guy is sending 10, the second guy is sending 9, the third guy is sending 9, right? How much can I rip out on, on this path? I can't rip out more than 9 units, right? Because if I take that out, you know, the, I, I can't send more than 9 units on that path, right? Okay, but I can send 9, right? Okay, so let's send 9 units on that path. So 9 units and then if I take that and say, okay, I'm going to send 9 units of flow on that path and remove that path and say, I'm done with that path, how much should I reduce the flow on the edges? I took out 9 units along that path, right? I should subtract the flow on all the edges because I took out that 9 units from it, right? Okay, if I subtract that, you know, what happens? Okay, this guy becomes 0, this guy becomes 0, this guy becomes 1, right? Okay, now let's look at, uh, if, if any, part, any edge with 0 is no longer useful to me, right? I can throw them out, right? Okay, okay now let me try to uh, find another path. Greedily again. Give me a path. Sorry? Uh, you want to take the bottom one or the straight one? Okay, let's do the bottom one. You can choose, but uh, since I'm not hearing very strong opinions, I'll just do something greedy, right? I'm not doing it, I mean, right? Okay, how much can I report on this? I can report 10, okay, then this becomes 0, this becomes 4, and this becomes 4. Okay, now give me, it gets more interesting, give me another path. Sorry? Okay, let me take an interesting path, right? Um, so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll do this, right? Uh, how about this? Okay? Okay, how much can I push on that? One unit, right? So this becomes uh, zero. Uh, this becomes zero. This becomes eight. Okay? Okay, now, uh, what, uh, give me one more. So, we are not done, right, because there is still flow, uh, right, going on, right? Okay. Sorry? Uh, shall I go straight? Okay, just to, okay, how much can I do on that? Four, so this becomes zero, this becomes four, this becomes four. Okay, now, okay. How about, uh, what else do I have left? Now, uh, let's see. Um, the, uh, so I go like this, right? Go like this. I have to go like this and go like this, right? Good. That's the only part, I think, right? How much can I put on that? Four, right? And then this becomes zero, this becomes zero, this becomes zero, that becomes zero. Oh, no, sorry, I shouldn't cut that out. This becomes zero, this becomes zero, right? And that's it. We're done, right? I mean, we're done in the sense that now there are no more paths from S to T in this graph, right? So what did we do? We took the flow, we ripped out one path at a time greedily, right? Arbitrarily, right? And each time, at least one edge becomes zero, right? Flow on that edge becomes zero because we, I mean, because we're doing greedily, it makes sense to, right? So one edge disappears from the graph at each situation, right? More than one edge can disappear, right? But at, if you do it greedily, we at least remove one edge, right? Okay, now what do we get? We get uh, a, how many paths can we get because of that? At most M paths you can get, right? Yeah, because each time I'm removing one edge, right? Okay. So, so there can't be more than M paths in this decomposition that I clearly, right? Yeah, that makes sense. And we can also do it efficiently in the sense that, and how long does it, we need to find a path in each iteration, right? You know, that's just checking whether there is a path from S to T with non-zero flow. And so it can do it in M square time. If you're more clever, you can do it in MN time. Okay. So you can do, okay, now does it make sense what we did? Okay. What does it mean? Does it make sense? 
we got a new flow on the paths, right? Okay, so for every path, we, so we, have, we found a bunch of paths and we put numbers on them. Is the value of the flow the same as the value of the original flow we started with? It turns out yes. Okay? So we are able, I mean, this requires a proof that we can convert an edge based flow into a path based flow by this greedy algorithm. So why is it possible? Because the flow conservation is true. The greedy algorithm won't get stuck in a bad situation in this decomposition because the edge based flow satisfies flow conservation. Okay, you have to see, I mean, it's not obvious. Okay? We need to see a proof of that. Okay? Does that make sense? So, okay, the theorem is that you can always decompose an edge based flow into a path based flow with at most m paths in the, because of the algorithm works correctly, we have to prove that, but if the algorithm works correctly, you are getting a flow decomposition with at most m paths and the value of the flow is same. Okay? So you can go between edge based flow and path based flow efficiently and it is good to think of both of these okay? and we will see many applications of this. Okay? Make sense? Question? Is there a one point relation? Like ah, no, right, you know, because given a edge based flow there could be, it is not unique, this path decomposition is not unique, right? You can see because I just picked paths out of my head, right? You know, whenever I had a choice I just picked arbitrarily. So it's easy to construct examples where uh, the, the different path based uh, 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 flows will give you the same edge based flow. So not unique, okay? So that's also, right? So for a given edge based flow, you can create many different path based flows. For instance, uh, yeah, I mean, you can easily construct a simple example, right? It, it's, as you can see, we did greedy algorithm, right? You know, I could have chosen any path I wanted in the first iteration. It changes how you decompose, okay? All right? Okay, so these two are equivalent as far as, you know, you know they, they have different properties, but it's useful to keep, keep that in mind, okay? Okay. Uh, now, one subtlety will come up that there can be cycles in this decomposition, we will we'll come back to that uh, um, later. Um, okay, so a little bit just, uh, you know, edge based flows are compact, right? You know, if you want to tell me what the edge based flow is, you can, you can tell me the one number per edge, right? And you can verify, oh, it satisfies capacity constraints, it satisfies the um, uh, flow conservation and then you know it's a flow. Path based flow, it seems like, you know, you may have to give me a lot of information, right? This path is this number, this path is this number, potentially exponential information. But as we saw, for every path based flow, there's a compact representation using only m paths, right? So that's uh, also a useful feature, okay? Okay, we'll come back. Okay, so now we've defined what a flow is, right? Now we, the natural algorithmic problem is, given a network, an S and T, how much flow can you send from S to T, right? The maximum flow problem, right? How much flow can you send from S to T, right? You want the flow of maximum value, right? From an application point of think of this, right? You know, S wants to communicate with T and it has this big network available to it. How much information can it send to T, right? That makes sense, right? You know, you want to optimize how much information you can send from S to T, right? And there are two ways of thinking about it, right? You can say, I, I want to send information along paths, or I can say, oh, I just want some information as long as it satisfies flow conservation and thing. But we saw that these two are equivalent. So it's okay, that's a robust definition, right? It, because both definitions are equivalent in terms of the value of the flow, okay? So now I can ask, you know, given, this is, this is the algorithmic optimization problem, right? Given a network, tell me how much flow you can route from S to T, right? Yeah? Make sense? Okay, so now this is a, not an easy problem, right? Um, okay, to understand uh, 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 how, uh, how to uh, deal with this, uh, this is a new paradigm. Uh, we'll first try to say, what is an upper bound on the flow I can send from S to T? Okay, how much flow can I send from S to T? How much, uh, right? You know, let's try to come up with an upper bound. Okay. Okay, so if I give you this graph and uh, uh, before I mold it, <laughs> right? Uh, okay, if I give you this graph, say for example this graph and say how much flow can I send from S to T, give me an upper bound. You say I, I can't, say how many say 30? Why 30? Mm -hmm. 
no, 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 no. I can, I can send, uh, I re look at the value of this, uh, uh, why is maximum capacity a limitation? Well, I can send along multiple paths, no? Right? Think of it that way. So clearly 50 is an upper bound, right? You know, if, you know I, all the flow has to reach, leave S. The only total capacity of the edges is uh, 20 plus 30, right? Out of S. So I can't send more than 50 units of flow, right? Uh, oh, but then, you know, if you look at sink, 47 is also an upper bound, right? Because uh, if I remove those, two, I mean, uh, flow has to go into the sink, right? Okay, is that, okay, what about other upper bounds? What about, you know, this upper bound? I remove this edge, this edge, suppose I remove this edge, these three edges. What is the sum of those capacities? 51, right? Did I get any better bound? Not really, right? Okay? So, what is, why is the upper bound around S, why is the sum of the edges leaving S an upper bound? Because it's, uh, in some sense, every path has to go from S to T using one of those edges. And they have to use up capacity on that edge, right? The total sum of all those edges is an upper bound on the flow because uh, each path from S to T has to use that edge, right? Okay? So the motivation for an upper bound is that a cut is an upper bound on the flow that can be sent from S to T. So what is a cut? Okay, let's define a cut now, right? It comes up naturally, right? So what is an ST cut? It is simply, there are again two different ways of thinking about cuts. I like to introduce both of them because it's important, I think, right? One simplest thing of saying, you know, it's a subset of the edges such that if I remove them, there is no path from S to T. Yeah? That's a cut, right? I'm removing, disconnecting S from T. Okay? And what is the capacity of the cut? It is simply the sum of the capacities of the edges in that set. Okay? Okay. Uh, so here are some examples, right? Here is a graph. Uh, what is the no most obvious cut? If I remove these three edges, then that is a cut, right? This edge, this edge, this edge, this edge is a cut, right? Clearly that's a, right? Uh, what about another cut? You know, edges around T, right? What about uh, some non-trivial cut? Give me another non-trivial cut, right? Uh, let's see, uh, what is another non-trivial cut? Uh, maybe uh, this guy, this guy, this guy, uh, this guy and this guy. That's also a cut, right? Yeah? yeah okay, so I mean, I, I can think of it like, uh, okay? Yeah? Okay. Um, Okay, that's, uh, that's good. Um, okay, but very careful. An ST cut doesn't mean there is no path from T to S. It's a directed graph, okay? Okay, uh, let me think of a, well, in this case, uh, there are no edges coming into T, S, so, you know, there is no way to go from T to S in this graph. But in general, right, okay, so here, let me add this, okay. Um, 10, okay, just, right? okay, now look at this, this cut, um, is that an ST cut, yeah, that is an ST cut, right, because they know, but uh, you can go from T to S, right, okay, ST cut doesn't mean that it's a T to S cut, very important, right, edges can go, uh, and there may be many ST cuts, they're actually exponentially many in general, and, uh, uh, yeah, so, um, okay. So let me define a notion of a minimal cut. What is a minimal cut? Okay, to define that, here is a, a cut which is not minimal. Okay, so here it is. I take this edge, this edge, this edge, and this edge. Why is it not minimal? What does it mean it's not minimal? Yeah. Let me see, I'm doing more work than I need to, right? That is, you know, I, I, I can, uh, I don't need to remove all four edges. I can uh, remove a subset of those edges, proper subset, and still a cut, right? 
So just a inclusion wise minimal, right? A minimal cut is a subset of edges such that I, if I take out any one of those edges, I, it's not a cut, okay? So this is not a minimal cut because I can omit this and it's still a cut, right? While, while uh, um, this is a, a minimal cut, right? Yeah? If I remove any one of those from the cut, then I, that's not a cut anymore, okay? So it's a natural notion of a minimal cut. Uh, okay, let's ignore that for now. Um, uh, so let's think of cuts in a slightly different way. Okay, again, you know, I, I do it uh, slowly, different definitions because you will see that you need to translate back and forth between these different notions. Okay, so another way of defining cuts is let's take a subset of the vertices which contain S and not contain T. Okay. So here is one subset, subset right? Uh, the obvious subset is uh, um, okay. Uh, here is another subset. Okay. Okay. Now, given any subset of the vertices which contains S and not T, it automatically defines a cut. What are the cut? All the edges leaving that subset containing S. Okay? Yeah, look in this uh, this green cut, what are the edges leaving that cut, right? F, T, C, E, and A, D. Right? So this is the edge leaving this cut. This Remember, we only count the edges leaving the cut, not coming into the cut. Okay? So this is an edge, this is an edge, and these are the edges leaving the cut. Yeah? So if you remove all of them, clearly S gets disconnected from T, right? Yeah, there is no way for S to reach that thing because I removed all the ways of leaving that set. Okay? So another way of defining cuts is saying, okay, I'm not going to think of it as subsets of edges, but I'm going to think of it as subsets of vertices. One of them contains S and there are, it doesn't contain T. Right? It's a partition of the vertices into two sets, which one contains A and B, where A contains S and B contains T. And now the, the set of edges are all edges leaving A. That's another way of thinking about cuts. Okay, which one is makes sense? It turns out that they're basically the same in a way, right? In the sense that any minimal ST cut corresponds to a vertex partition. Okay, why is that? Okay, so think of it like this. Suppose I remove a set of edges and I cannot go from S to T. Okay, why, how do you prove that S cannot reach T? How do you figure it out? If I ask you algorithmically, can S reach T, what, do you, what does your algorithm do? How do you check whether S can reach T in a graph? Sorry? No, it could be a long path, no? So, so uh, the algorithm, I, I give a graph and say, can S reach T? How do you check? Uh, take all the neighbors of S and say, can they reach T? And then uh, kind of do your algorithm to try to reach T. Uh, so, whether you have like Dijkstra or something, then you reach T. No, this is the most basic thing you do, no? DFS or BFS, right? Yeah, yeah. Right? You know? <laughs> okay. You just search the graph, right? Yeah? I mean, you know, that, that's DFS or BFS. Or you can do any, anything there. I mean, it doesn't have to be DFS or BFS. Or it's, you explore the graph, right? Okay. Okay, when do you know it can reach T or not T? How do you know? It gets stuck at some... I mean, so what happens at the end of the algorithm? Right? You get a set of nodes S can reach. And if T is in that, you're happy. Otherwise, you know that S cannot reach T, right? Okay? Agreed? Okay, but what is that set of nodes S can reach have? The, what is the property it has? I, I can't increase that set anymore, no? What does that mean? Suppose T can't be reached from S. I, I, I reach all these guys and then I can't reach anymore. What does it mean? There is no edge leaving the set from outside, right? 
Yeah? That means all the edges are coming in to that set. Right? There is no edge leaving that set because if there is an edge leaving that set, I will go to the next guy, right? And I'll get one more guy that can be reached by S. Right? So at the end of your DFS or BFS, what do you get? You get a tree, a directed tree rooted at the source that covers all the guys that you can reach and then you get stuck. Okay? Okay? So basically, if, you know, for every cut, I can figure out what guys I can reach and the cut is precisely the set of edges that leaves that set of the, 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 what I can reach. Okay? So if I give you a set of edges and say this is a cut, how will you verify it? You remove them okay? and then try to explore from the source and whatever you get, if that T is not in that, then you know it's a cut. Okay, just to give you an example, right? Uh, uh, let's see. Um, let, let's do it on this graph, right? Um, okay. So let's take. Uh, um, suppose my, uh, you know, uh, this one. Um, this one, just let me make it a bit silly. Okay. Is it a cut? No, it's not a cut. Why is it not a cut? Sorry? Can S reach T? Okay, let's run an algorithm, <laughs> right? Uh, we'll explore from S. What can S reach in the first iteration, right? You know, S can reach uh, in, the, in the graph without those red edges, right? S can reach uh, A, B, C, no? Uh, can it reach anything else? No, right? Okay. Okay. So we draw a circle around this. This is the set that can be reached by S after I remove those red edges. Okay. So what property should be satisfied if uh, those red edges form a cut? If I look at all the red edges and remove them, only edges coming to that should be incoming edges, right? So red edges are being removed and now is this a minimal cut? Why is it not a minimal cut? Yeah, why is it? Because it is not leaving my reachable set now. I don't need that, right? Okay? Anything that doesn't leave my reachable set is irrelevant edge, right? Even if I throw that out, I still get a cut, right? So this red edge is not relevant, right? Make sense? So okay. Now all I'm trying to say is that any minimal cut corresponds to a vertex partition. Okay? We are only interested in minimal cuts, right? Why do we need non-minimal cuts? They're not very interesting. So minimal cuts correspond to vertex partitions. So you can define a cut as simply a set of edges whose removal disconnects S and S from T. Or you can say it's a vertex partition with S inside one part and T inside the other part and the set of edges leaving that A is a cut. They're both equivalent in the sense not technically equivalent because there are cuts in the edge definition which don't correspond to vertex partitions. But if you're interested in minimal cuts, you might as well stick with vertex partitions. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so we'll think of uh, cuts as uh, both ways. Okay, it's it's important to keep that in mind. Uh, okay, you will see in in graph theory, cuts are are uh, defined uh, slightly differently sometimes. This vertex partition, this notion of delta, delta of a set of vertices is a set of all edges leaving that set of vertices. Okay, delta plus is a set of edges going out, and delta minus is a set of edges coming in. Okay, that's some notation you'll see later on if you. If you Okay, now what is the minimum cut problem? The minimum cut problem is given S and T, find the cut with the smallest capacity. Okay, so if all capacities are 1, what does it mean? If all edge capacities are exactly 1, what are we asking? What is the smallest number of edges that we need to remove so that there is no path from S to T? That's the problem I started the lecture with. Right? Right? 
if all capacities are 1. If the capacities are different, that means we are trying to solve a more general problem which is weighted problem, right? Some edges have huge capacity, some do not have that much capacity. Then we are asking, it is not how many edges, but what is the sum of the capacities of the edges, okay? All right? So here, for example, I, I give you this complicated graph, what is the minimum cut? I do not know, right? It is very hard, no? It is harder than finding the smallest number of edges because here it is like numbers are involved now, right? Oh, I mean, okay, 10, 5, 15, you know, it can be quite complicated, right? Yeah? So that is the minimum cut problem, right? We saw a maximum flow problem and we saw a minimum cut problem. Now, what are the, how are they linked, right? Uh, uh, so there is no easy way to solve this problem. Um, one thing we can say is the following, right? Every ST cut gives us an upper bound on the amount of flow you can send from S to T. Okay, is, right? Okay, I say if you if you give me a set of edges such that if I remove them, there is no path from S to T. The total sum of the capacities of the edges gives an upper bound on the flow you can route from S to T. Is that intuitively or clear? Right? Because if I remove those edges. I, I can't get from S to T. So any path from S to T has to use up the capacity on that edge, right? If you think about the flow, path definition of flow, then every path has to use the, well, at least one of the edges in the cut, right? That's the only way to go from S to T, right? So if I put 10 units on that path, it means that I have to remove at least 10 units from the capacity of that cut, right? The total flow I can send from S to T is upper bounded by the capacity of the cut. Does that make sense? Yes? No? Is that, yeah? So you can intuitively, I mean, that C and you can formally prove it, right? Remember, it's only an upper bound because the, the, the path might go multiple times through that cut, right? Okay? So at least you need at least one edge in the cut on every path from S to T. So the total value of the flow is less than the total capacity of the cut. Yeah? So clearly, the maximum flow has to be less than or equal to the minimum cut, right? Right? Take a maximum flow and take a minimum cut. The value of this flow is every flow is less than or equal to the value of this cut in particular. So I can take the maximum flow and take the minimum cut and still get the property that the value of the flow is less than or equal to the cut. So the maximum flow has to be less than or equal to the minimum cut. Yeah? Is that clear or no? Yeah? Questions on that? Yeah? Okay. Um, okay, this is the fundamental theorem in combinatorial optimization that in any network, the maximum flow is actually equal to the minimum cut, okay? All right? It is not at all obvious, right, that this is true, right? And it is true for all networks, right? Graphs are complicated. So the theorem is very powerful because in any directed network with any arbitrary capacities, the value of the maximum flow is equal to the minimum cut. It is always less than equal to, right? That is easy to see, okay? But it is equal to, okay? That is why it is very powerful, okay? And so basically, you know, there is a duality and so it makes uh, algorithms also feasible, right? And uh, uh, so, yeah, we will, we'll, you know, this is a cornerstone theorem in combinatorial optimization, okay? And, and there is huge number of applications in uh, optimization, graph theory, combinatorics, uh, information theory, you know, you name it, there is, it's a very fundamental result, okay? Um, so, okay, now that's a the theorem, we'll see the proof of it, but we'll actually see an algorithmic proof of it, right? What does it mean we see an algorithmic proof of it? I want to compute the maximum flow and I also want to compute the minimum cut, right? If I can compute the maximum flow, I get minimum cut for free, right? Because of the theorem, right? Or if I can compute the minimum cut, I get the maximum flow for free, right? It turns out that it's, that's not the right way to think about it. The, fa the thing is that the fact that they're equal is what makes the computation also efficient. Okay? The fact that they're equal is what makes the computation e easy. Not the way the fact that, you know, uh, the theorem implies, uh, I mean, not that the computation is easy implies the theorem actually. So, okay? Uh, okay. Uh, so, we'll see this and uh, to, uh, let me see, where are we? Okay, um, let me, uh, this, uh, let's see, 
let's let's start the uh, uh, a basic way of thinking about that uh, that uh, maximum flow problem and then we'll continue in the next lecture okay let's see how how we would like to solve the maximum flow problem right and we'll do one definition which is which is important and then um, okay so so now we we switch to uh, uh, the, the the algorithmic problem right i give you a graph and i will say compute for me the maximum flow okay okay the first thing you can try is like like they did the flow decomposition let's try something greedy right something simple right i give you this graph and say okay how much flow can i send here the path based definition actually makes sense right i say it's hard to think about uh, edge based flow right what is the maximum flow well okay first i have to define what a flow is okay flow is a assignment of numbers to edges such that it satisfies flow conservation and satisfies capacity and then it is a flow out of the s minus flow into s okay, how do i optimize that right even a greedy algorithm for that would be kind of painful right to think about how do you satisfy the flow conservation constraint and that's not easy but the path based definition is uh, at least the heuristically is easy right i just have to give you a collection of paths and some numbers so that i make sure that i don't exceed the capacity so and we can find paths so if you go, give me this graph you know at least if you don't know anything about flow you can come up with some solution right how you say okay how do you come up with a solution in this graph i just want to send some flow from s to t okay i find a path i send some flow on that remove it and try it right that makes sense so you say okay you know i have a graph like this let me send some flow on it right you know i'll take a path from s to t how much take any path um, here is a greedy algorithm right take a path from s to t using svt okay how much flow can i send on it 10 units right if i do that what happens i can uh, one edge disappears right i rip, rip that path out like we are doing flow decomposition right okay uh, then uh, i find another path right yeah and uh, i found another path right okay see is it clear what we are doing first path we took 10 out and then next path we took another 10 out and then they will still have another 10 right okay so and then what is the total flow we sent so the 10 10 10 right okay so total flow is what 30 right and is it uh, the maximum flow why yeah there's a cut of value 30 separating s from t right around s so we are able to get a flow which equals the value of a cut so it has to be optimal right yeah okay so great we got uh, lucky this time we think right you know so now the question is you know does the greedy algorithm always work right yeah, that's, you know, if it works great right we solve a nice problem right and um, here is a how did you find the paths though right what if the, we tried that path first okay remember the greedy algorithm i don't know i mean i just picking paths arbitrarily right suppose i pick that path what happens how much can i send on that 20 right okay what happens after i send 20 units on that path what happens to the capacity of this this becomes zero right i'm done yeah this becomes uh, zero right and this becomes zero then is there any path after that from s to t right i'm done right i'm stuck so if i chose the wrong path in the first iteration i only get 20 units of flow and then i'm going i'm stuck yeah okay so clearly the greedy algorithm doesn't work right yeah i mean if you pick the paths badly you won't get uh, a an algorithm right which will work correctly all the time yes is it point clear okay so you may say okay maybe there's a clever way of picking the paths that would always give a right answer right there is, i mean we know the definition of flow involves paths so if you know there is a maximum flow so if you can find those paths great right how do i figure out those paths i don't know right 
there are exponentially many paths, so I, all I can do is find one path, right? So I can't just, uh, I can't just uh, figure out how to find the path. Maybe there are clever ways of finding a path, right? But turns out that that's not the right way to think about it. Uh, so greedy can get stuck. So the key idea is that it's, you know, can we, what does it mean to send a flow along the first path we picked arbitrarily? So we put some amount of flow on that path, right? Now the question is, you know, why is this path uh, not optimal? Well, you know, because uh, you shouldn't send all 20 units of flow on that path, okay? In the optimal flow, you should only send 10 units of flow on that path or on that middle edge, right? So it would be nice if somehow we are not stuck with the, the initial path we, we chose, okay? That is, we make a choice in the initial path, can we sort of give ourselves the flexibility to change the value of the flow on that edges in later iterations, right? If you have that flexibility, then it will allow us maybe to get to the optimum better, okay? So this motivates the, the definition of, you know, we need to allow ourselves the flexibility to reduce the flow on an edge that we initially sent flow on. But how do we capture that, right? It seems hard to figure out how to reduce flow because that requires subtraction, right? That's a little bit hard to capture, but there's a very simple and nice uh, graph theoretic way of doing that. And that is the notion of a residual graph, okay? So this is a key definition, right? So here is the thing. I start with a graph and I have some capacities, right? I already sent some flow on that graph, okay? I, I computed some flow on the graph. What does that mean? That I have a value of a flow on each edge, so it satisfies flow conservation and it satisfies capacity constraints. Okay, now I want to see if I can send more flow in this graph, right? Okay? Either I have to check that it's a maximum flow, or if it's not a maximum flow, I have to figure out whether I can send more flow in this graph. Yeah? So how do I capture that? Okay? So we, we define a, a new graph, okay, with two types of edges, okay? Forward edges and backward edges, okay? So what is the definition? So the graph has the same set of vertices, okay? For every edge, what, is it, what do we know currently? We know its capacity and how much flow we are currently sending on it, right? Okay, so if I send, if I have an edge of capacity 30 and I send 20 units of flow already on that, how much more can I send on that edge? 10 units, right? I can't send more than 10 units on it. So I'll put in my new graph an edge, a copy of that edge with capacity 10. What does it mean that if you want to send more flow, you can only send 10 more units on that edge. Okay? That makes sense? Okay. That is saying, you know, how much residual capacity is there on that edge. Okay. But I also want to allow myself the ability to decrease flow on an edge. Okay? Decreasing flow is hard, right? So what I will do is that I will think of decreasing flow by putting an edge in the reverse direction. Okay? If I send flow in the edge in the reverse direction, that means I'm thinking about reducing the flow. Okay? Okay. How much flow can I reduce if I'm sending 20 units on an edge? I can't reduce more than 20 because if I reduce more than 20, I'll get less than zero in the original edge. Right? Okay? So I put a reverse edge in the gra new graph with capacity 20, which is capacity is exactly the amount of flow I'm currently sending on it. Okay? Okay. Here is an example. Right? Okay. What is this graph on the left side? It is a network along with capacities which are given in black and an existing flow. The 20 represents what? The current flow I'm sending on this graph, right? 20, 20, 20. Remember that as the greedy algorithm chose that and it'll get stuck. Okay. Now I want to create a new graph, okay, which allows me to think about how much is left in the graph, okay? Okay, what do I do? For each edge I look at, I, I create two copies, right? One this way, one this way, okay? For this edge from S to U, can I increase any flow on that? 
because I'm already stuck there, right? So I don't put a forward edge because there is no capacity left on that. Okay? So there is no forward edge because the amount of capacity that I have left is zero. So there's no point putting that in edge, right? So I don't put it. But can I reduce flow on that edge? I can, right? How much can I reduce it by? Up to 20, right? So I put in a reverse edge with capacity 20, which implies that I can go down by 20 units on that original edge. Okay. What about the middle edge UV, right? How much flow did I send on it currently? 20 units. So if I want to increase the flow on it, how much should I send? How, how much can I send? I have 10 more units, right? So I, I keep the ten, uh, edge with capacity 10 from S to uh, U to V, but I also add an edge from V to U with capacity 20, which is what it's saying is that I can reduce the flow by 20 units on that edge. That makes sense? Okay. I do it for all the edges. This is called the residual graph. Okay. Remember the residual graph is defined with respect to the original capacities and what? An existing flow. Okay. So if the flow is zero initially, what is the residual graph of the original graph? Initially the flow is zero say everywhere. The same graph, right? Yeah? Because you know, I still have the same, every edge will be remain there with the same capacity because the flow is zero. And since there is no flow on any edge, I won't put a re reverse arc because that would have zero capacity, right? So the residual graph of the original graph is what? It's, it's itself, right? If there is no flow on it, okay? Does it make sense? Okay. So here is the basic, uh, uh, okay, how many edges can the residual graph have, right? If the original graph had m edges, it can have at most two m edges, right? So you may wonder, uh, what happens if I have an edge uh, between u and v and v and u in the original graph? Okay, it will create now four edges, right? Okay, okay, so here is just a, something that no, no one asked, but suppose, you know, I have u and v. I have, I have both edges in the original graph. That's fine, right? That's allowed. Uh, suppose, you know, this is 5 out of 10 and uh, 6 out of 10. What should I do? I, I, I know I, I have, I'll get like four edges, right? I'll get a multigraph. But do I need this? Does it make sense? Okay. If I have 5 going this way and 6 going that way, I claim I can, that's a cycle, right? I can remove 5 and the value of the flow won't change at all. Okay. I mean, we'll come back to this later. Okay, if, I ha if I ever see a flow like this, I can basically take out 5 from this and take out six, uh, 5 from this. What happens? The value of the flow goes down on this edge by 5 and on this edge by 5. Flow conservation is still satisfied, right? Because I took 1 out, 1 in. The value of the flow doesn't change, except that I've reduced the flow a little bit on some arcs. What happens then? One of the edges will get zero flow, right? So you don't need cycles in the flow. We'll come back to it later, right? So it's just a small point, but technically speaking, you create uh, two edges for each edge. So that, that's, that's um, okay. So the main observation is that the residual graph captures the residual problem exactly, okay? So here is a key lemma, right, uh, which we'll uh, see later. Um, if you start with a flow on the original graph and create the residual graph, okay, and now it's a new graph, right? You compute some flow on the new graph. You can add that back to the original graph. So if I compute a flow on the residual graph, I can add it to my original flow and I'll get a new valid flow, okay? Uh, moreover, if I actually there is a, if I have a current graph with value flow and there is actually a bigger flow in the graph, in the residual graph there will be a flow of value the bigger minus my current flow, okay? What these two lemmas will say is that basically you can start with a flow, you can compute the residual graph and you can recursively work on the residual graph, okay? So whatever you compute you can add it to the original graph. And moreover, the lemma is saying that if in fact there is a flow which is bigger than the what you have, you will be able to compute that in the residual graph, okay? So you'll be able to, it's very nice, it's like addition of numbers, right? 
you can go from the original graph with the flow to a residual graph and recursively solve the problem on the residual graph, okay. So these two lemmas will allow you to do that, okay. This is a very important observation. So in effect, the residual graph completely captures what you need to do with the rest of the problem. You compute a flow, get to the residual graph, and just work on the residual graph now, right. Compute another flow, create another residual graph, compute, okay. I will see more details, okay. Okay, good.